people coming in. Hello, everybody. Hi, we're going to give everyone a couple minutes to get in. Up. Hello, everyone. Happy International Women's Day. Hi, everybody. If you were on our last program or you, you weren't, we'd love to hear where you're calling in from or watching from. So if you would just put in the chat where you are located, we'd love to, to see. So just let us know. Oh, from Italy. Hello. And Richmond. Hi, everybody. True International Women's Day. I love it. An art teacher. Hello from Vermont. Wonderful. Montana, Los Angeles, Arizona, local Bethesda. We love it. Hi, everybody. We're just going to get started in just a minute or so. From Charlottesville, hi. You guys are having a good start to your International Women's Day. Another art teacher. Hello, another art teacher. We love it. All righty. Hi, everybody. All right, let's say let's give it one more minute, Eliz uh, Emily, and then we'll go from there. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> From Montreal, an artist. Hello. All right. Well, I think we're going to go ahead and get started and we'll just let people in as we go. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, celebrating International Women's Day with us this afternoon uh, with NIMWA. Some of you might have been in our our program from this morning, but I'm just so happy to have you all here to learn some really exciting stuff from Emily um, and our, I call it, I don't think it's as hidden anymore, but our amazing archives and the amazing uh, Betty Boyd Dietrich Library and Research Center at the museum. So Emily's put together a really amazing presentation today and I'm about to pass it to her, but let me, introduce her to you all. Um, Emily is the archival assistant at the museum and she has a background in art history and cinema. Uh, she's currently focusing on the intersection of art and archives and looking at how we can capture the creative process and approach it as an archive in itself. She is a super fan of primary source work, which you'll see today for sure, <laughs> and um, excited about inviting everyone, artists, researchers, kids, and the public, all of you here with us into our archives to collaborate and learn as a community. So with that, I will pass it over to Emily um, to take it from here. Perfect. So thank you, Carolyn. Um, as introduced, I am the archival assistant here at the library and our archives of women artists or the AWA as we call it, um, consists of manuscript collections of both women artists and then also organizations that document careers as well as networks that sprung out of women coming together to work creatively and to create opportunity. Um, our archives are used by scholars, curators, and the public, and we are really interested in making all of our materials available and accessible in order to promote the important work that women artists have done and are currently doing. Uh, and then in addition to that, we also support scholarship and other creative work. So not all of our materials are digitized, some of them are, but if you have any interest or any questions, please feel free to reach out to me directly. I love to share our collections and I am always up for a reference or a chat. So with that, let's get started.
Beautiful. All right, so today we are going to be exploring the archival collections of a group of festivals that coincided with the UN Conference on Women. This collection was donated by Soon Young Yoon, who is an advocate for women's rights and who currently serves as a United Nations representative um, on the International Alliance of Women. These three art festivals grew consecutively and they provide a lot of insight into how women artists came together to promote each other's work, to learn from each other and to celebrate the art, um, the impact that art has had on women specifically, but then also on society more broadly. The collections document more than just a festival themselves. Um, they include correspondence, flyers, posters, and ephemera related to the work that artists were doing up until the event itself, and also cover other, other programming, including dance and theater. So I have titled this presentation Networked Women uh, because in going through the collections and in doing my research, I was really struck with how an international network was created out of the vision of a few women in the late 1970s. Um, and I really believe that we actually, I think we have some of the participants here today on the chat. So if any of you are here, let us know and uh, feel free to jump in with any thoughts or insight. Let's go to the next slide. Beautiful. All right, so here we see a picture from the conference that happened in Nairobi. And the dates aren't on this slide and that's okay. It took place over three, dec or three um, continents over 15 years. In 1980, it took place in Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, it was called the International Festival of Women Artists. Five years later, it moved to Nairobi, Kenya and became the Focus International Festival. And then 10 years after that, it moved to Beijing, China, where it was the Global Focus Festival. So as I mentioned, these festivals occurred in conjunction with the World Conference on Women that was part of the United Nations Decade for Women that ran from 1975 to 1985. So the UN Conference itself started in 1975 in Mexico City. And the women artists who attended that conference had no organizational backing or formal, formal programming. So at a subsequent national conference in Houston, they came together and started to organize to do an actual organized festival. The UN conference had objectives and actions for the advancement of women with the goal of realizing gender equality, covering 12 areas of concern, including women in poverty, women in health, and women in the media. And then the art festivals themselves were the brainchild of a woman named Susan Schwab, who is a working artist who specializes in silver point and metal point, metal point drawing. And she's currently working in New York City. And I'm happy to pop her website into the chat if anybody wants to check her out. The events included literary readings, films, videos, slideshows of work, performances, panel discussions, and exhibitions. And were described by Cindy Lyle, who was a participant and organizer, as a catalyst for the creation of an international community and network of women artists that sprung out of awareness of common concerns, namely discrimination in galleries, discrimination in museums, discrimination in teaching jobs and in art history books, which is obviously something that we here at NIMWA are also very interested in working on. It is estimated that 8,000 women came and saw the exhibitions in Copenhagen and that 14,000 attended in Nairobi. And the basic framework for the art that was included was that it must, quote, depict an issue or a statement of concern to women and must relate directly to the dialogue or spirit of the conference. Next slide. Beautiful. So this is a photograph of some of the original founders of the festival. This is their first meeting. And I think you can really feel the excitement and enthusiasm that they were bringing to the project. From the left, we have Jackie Ray and then Susan Swalb, who I already mentioned. She's the one with the text on her shirt. We have Nancy Cusick, Eloise Schleuder, and then Sylvia Moore, who served as an associate project coordinator. Initially, this group of women was hoping to raise enough money to send 15 to the UN conference in Copenhagen, but that grew very quickly. And eventually the festival would include artists from more than 30 countries, including 437 from the United States alone, which is amazing. And the women were able to secure some funding, both from sponsors and then also the American government. 
Susan Swalb worked directly with the State Department in Copenhagen. She actually visited the city in the summer before in 1979 and made contact with two Danish women, um, Helen Lake Klug, who is an artist, and then also Helen Layson, who is an art historian. And together they started to lay the seeds to make this project possible. And in a letter to Danish artist Annalise Hansen, Susan said that her vision, quote, was to make Copenhagen alive with art from every corner at once. And in another letter to a writer named Tove Burup, she said, quote, imagine the beauty of women artists from everywhere, talking, sharing, exchanging, viewing each other's works and ideas. Imagine what could come out of it, a true network of women in art and beyond. And I think that that quote really captures the spirit of the festival. It was an event that started pretty small and scrappy, just making use of a loose uh, network of women, keeping in mind that this was all happening before the internet. And then it gradually grows and grows. And by the time we get to Beijing in 1995, the UN itself is really starting to offer its support. So we are gonna now take a look at how the festival was organized. Let's take a look at the next slide. Great, so this is a letter that Susan wrote to a woman named Betty Yozel, who is based in Copenhagen. And this is about a year before the festival itself. And in this, Yozel first discusses her recent knee surgery. And then they're going over the practicalities of arranging lodging for the American women. And Yozel says, quote, I feel responsible for the housing of the American women coming. So far, I've got places for 10 and various friends of mine's homes. Don't panic. I'm trying to find nice homes for everyone. I think you may be stuck on Karen's sofa, I'm afraid, but with housing so tight here, it's not a bad setup. I got the word that your people are not into sleeping on floors. Any exceptions to that that I could know about? And I love this letter because I think it really demonstrates how the festival was arranged from the ground up with women on opposite sides of the world working together. And again, when we think about this happening pre-internet, pre we can think about the intensity of time and effort that creating this event took and that they were working together to make it possible for as many women to attend as they could. And many of these artists weren't receiving any kind of funding and just had to make do. Um, so we start to see this informal network make its way um, into being. Let's look at the next one. Great. So this is a letter from Eloise Schleuder to Susan Schwab. Um, Eloise worked with the Coalition of Women's Arts Organizations, which is a co-sponsor of the festival. And on this piece, I love to get to see the remnants of what I think is Susan's visual thought process in these doodles. They're fun and they're colorful. And I like to imagine her drawing them as she's thinking about the festival and kind of mulling over her options. This letter is a little bit more poignant when we realize that it's describing an element of tension between the coalition of women's arts organization and Susan's. And Schleuder's tone is clarifying, I think, in her sign off where she says, quote, you done good kid and we will all be there to help you pull it off. I think this is alluding to the challenges that Schwab was facing and coordinating so many different things, you know, and trying to bring together artists from all over the country and the world, given the technology of the time and the scope, I'm sure she had a lot of balls in the air. And I think Eloise strikes this sort of encouraging attaboy attitude, which was probably motivating for Susan at the time. Let's look at the next one. Great. So speaking of some of the balls that she must have had in the air, this letter gives us an idea of the type of management that Susan Schwab was doing and the broad scope of the project. Um, you know, this entailed everything from navigating international bureaucracies to processing applications of artists who wanted to participate to providing encouragement to attendees who are struggling to make it happen, which is what we can see in this letter. So this letter comes from Monica Zhu, who was an artist who wanted to participate. And we can see what she was doing in order to make it possible for her to attend. Um, Monica notes that, quote, we'll need some space to be able to sell our posters to recover some of the travel expenses because they weren't receiving any funding or grants to attend. And Monica was an interesting artist who is interested in the intersection of art and magic. The slides, posters, and postcards that she submitted for the festival in Copenhagen had previously been shown as part of Gay Pride in London in June of 1979. And her letter mentions that her work was shown with the cooperation of matriarchy study groups, which sounds fascinating and like a study group I would like to be a part of. But my favorite part of this letter is the sign off where she says yours in sisterhood and the goddess, which is something I'm considering adding to my email signature. 
So now that we've got an idea of sort of the behind the scenes, how the festival was getting arranged, we are going to head to Copenhagen. It's the summer of 1980. So get your shoulder pads ready and we're gonna go check it out. So next slide, please. Beautiful. So the UN conference here was focusing on employment, health and education. And the program of action called for a national measures to ensure women's ownership and control of property and protections and um, protecting women's right to inheritance, child custody and nationality, which are all pretty essential pieces of citizenship. The uh, art festival was held at the Glypta Tech Museum in Copenhagen, um, which is an institution that Susan had visited the summer of 1979 to start to lay the groundwork for the festival. Let's go to the next slide. Great, and now we get to see a little bit of the ephemera. So on the left, we see the cover of one of the booklets that was created for the festival. I love that it embodies the spirit and excitement of the conference, the sort of like Where's Waldo style drawing that's depicting a somewhat chaotic urban scene. And then on the right, we see a program for one of the dance performances that took place over the two week festival of the period. And interesting on this, we can we see the ones that are listed. And then in addition to that, uh, the other sponsors were Clarial, Sears, the Eastman Foundation, Playboy, Xerox, Elizabeth Arden, Max Factor, and Miss Magazine. So kind of an interesting lineup there. And that list is just another indication of the amount of work and coordination that creating this festival required. So let's go to the next slide and look at some of the art. Beautiful. So as I mentioned earlier, the festival had artists from over 30 countries, including Pakistan, Australia, and Tunis, with 437 artists coming from the United States alone. The stuff that was going on with the UN, the and social events, dance, plays, and performance arts, a relatively extensive film program, a running slideshow, and a postcard exhibition. So those last two elements were the way by which any interested woman artist could participate in the festival. By sending a resume and either two slides or an art postcard, women became part of the festival itself. The slideshow was played continuously at the Glyptotech with the slides being switched in and out to ensure that everybody's art got shown. And then the postcards were made into a standalone exhibition. And included in that was assemblage artist, pardon me, assemblage artist Betty Saar, whose piece, The Long Memory, is in the Nimwa collection and is the piece you see here. This is not the piece that she showed uh, at the festival, but I thought it would be fun to create that little bridge between Copenhagen and Nimwa. In addition to her, other notables that you may know were Audre Lorde and Linda Nochlin. So with that basic overview of how the festival was functioning, let's look at a little bit more detail of some of these participants, starting with their resumes. Let's look at the next slide. Great. So these artists' resumes are really fascinating objects in of themselves, and I think that they reveal as much about the society that these women were working in as they do about the women's work itself. So this is the resume, slightly redacted, of a woman who was at the time an assistant professor at the University of the District of Columbia. And here we see that she includes not only information about where she has studied and where she works or where she has published or where her art has been shown, but she also includes her date of birth, the date of her marriage, her height, her weight, and the age of her children. So I think this gives us a lot of insight into the realities of being a working woman at this time and what was deemed important and or valuable about her. And as we go through a few more of these resumes, you'll see how different women approach describing themselves professionally and how, at least in the context of this festival, they were presenting themselves or you know, indeed creating an image for the public. That said, I showed this resume to one of my colleagues at the museum and she had a different read, which I thought was really interesting. She suggested that the inclusion of the height and the weight and all of that may actually have been more of like a cheeky gesture that she was intentionally putting in to comment. Um, so either way, I think they're interesting interpretations and I'm very curious to hear what other people might have to say about that. Let's go to the next one. Good. 
So here we have a very different type of resume. This is of an Ingrid Voigt of Eugene, Oregon, which is a state that is very close to my heart. And I love this resume because it's handwritten. It's somewhat like hastily put together and suggests that maybe she didn't have a resume on hand. And another thing I love, excuse me, about this resume and a number of other ones that I found is that they include the detail about where these women were traveling, um, which was certainly an essential piece of their creative growth and also may indicate where some of their influences may have come from. Let's go to the next one. Right. So I love this one too of Johanna Volgensang. So similar to the one that we just looked at, it seems like this resume was created for this singular purpose. And it demonstrates how her work was functioning within a larger political and cultural context. She makes a point of mentioning that her work has been sold to raise money for peace and civil causes rather than being sought off by, after investors. And I think in many ways, the festival itself was a political gesture. By declaring art as an essential piece of the puzzle of women's rights, Susan Schwab and the other founders and all of the participants were carving out this arena for activation and creativity that would fuel further discussion and change. Let's go to the next one. Great. So this one is by Rosemary Anderson, and it reminds me a little bit of some of the Gorilla Girls posters in that it's a poster describing or meditating on what being a woman artist is. She talks about the tension between what is externally um, assumed versus what may be internally desired and the compromises that so many women have to make in order to fulfill their assumed social roles in addition to their own ambitions. And I think the final paragraph really just to, excuse me, describes succinctly what the festival was designed to do, to discover other women artists, to teach classes to women, and to make a commitment to oneself and one's sisters. So I like to imagine the organizers receiving this resume and maybe feeling shored up by this common vision and faith and the possibilities of organizing around creative work. So now that we've looked at some of these resumes, let's move on to the art. We're gonna take a look at a couple of the postcards that were submitted to be exhibited in the show. Let's go to the next one. Great. So one of my favorite things about this collection is having this sensation of flipping through a book and like a snapshot of art at this time. Most of the postcards that were um, submitted were created by women who are making art, but not necessarily making a living making art. And the exhibition offered them the opportunity to show and for them now to be part of us here at NIMWA. So as an unjuried exhibition, it was a real display of work across the board. This is a little piece by a woman named Annette Weld, whose website we're happy to drop into the chat. Um, and her website mentions that she was raised on the northwest frontier of India, where her father was a brigadier general. And it's the website notes that the early impressions of color and movement of India influenced her vigorous style, which is something I think we can see here. Let's go to the next one. Great, so this is a postcard of a photograph by a woman named Elsa Dorfman. It's a portrait of Bob Dylan on his Rolling uh, Thunder Review, which was a tour he was on from 1975 to 1976. And Dorfman worked primarily in large format Polaroids and she just died last year. So according to her resume, which reads more like a short essay, Dorfman started working at the Evergreen Review in 1959, where she arranged early poetry readings for Allen Ginsberg, Michael McClure, and Philip Whelan. The Antioch Review published 33 of her portraits of poets in 1970, after um, what she had group and one woman shows at the Museum of Fine Arts San Francisco, the University Art Museum at Berkeley, and the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. And I think this postcard really demonstrates how instrumental women were in organizing art at the time and how different artists working in different mediums uh, supported and collaborated with each other. Let's go to the next one. Great, so this is the last postcard that we are going to look at from Copenhagen. And it's a small painting by a woman named Rosalind Mosquita. In addition to being an artist, she is also a teacher and presumably a very good one. She won the Los Angeles County Teacher of the Year Award in 1999. In addition to being beautiful, I love that this postcard calls for the acknowledgement of the first American artists and advocates for an intersectional look at identity and recognition in art and society more broadly. So now let's move on a little bit and check out some of the other stuff that was happening in Copenhagen. Let's go to the next one. Great. 
So here we have an image of a group of women standing in front of the mini art show in Copenhagen. From left to right, we have Synthony Navretta, who administered the United States program and was instrumental in getting funding from the Department of State. We also have Gloria Orenstein, who worked with Audre Lorde to coordinate the poetry program. Then we have Lorde herself. And then finally, we have Susan Schwab. So Lord organized the American Literary Program, which explored themes of transformation and rebirth, protest and revolution. And as part of that, she read the works of minority women writers. And in addition to the more standard visual arts and literary programs, um, as I mentioned, there was a pretty notable little film festival. This portion of programming was extensive. There were over 20 films shown that ranged from avant-garde abstractions to documentaries. I'm right now in the process of creating a research guide that's going to include all of the titles, but if anyone is interested, just let me know and I'm happy to send the list to you. I've had some luck tracking down some of these films online, but not everything seems to be available. But we are going to watch a short clip of one of the films that showed. This is part of a film called They Are Their Own Gifts by Lucille Rhodes and Margaret Murphy. This 1978 film was a triptych of film portraits that included chapters on poet and activist Muriel Rukeyser and choreographer Anna Sokolow. The portrait, or pardon me, the portion that we're going to see is a brief clip from the section about Alice Neal, whose painting T.B. Harlem we have in our collection. So we're big fans over, of her over here at Nimwa. And then after that, we're going to wrap up Copenhagen by looking at one more piece of ephemera and then head to Kenya. I don't feel either that there is definite female painting, you know. I don't think you could tell a man's painting from a woman's painting. I don't think there's an iconography that goes especially with women. In fact, some man on the WPA, he was a Puerto Rican, I think he said, oh, Alice Neal, the woman that paints like a man. But I, I told him, look, I don't paint like a man, I paint like a woman but I just don't paint China or something. Not that that's despicable either. I don't think that's despicable. That was just being anti-woman to think that painting China was uh, despicable, you know? I think what I was trying to do too is get away from the uh, soda cracker quality of America. I lived in Harlem for 25 years, Spanish Harlem. Carla, the TB case. I painted this in 1940. Statistically, Spanish Harlem had the highest TB rate of any place in the city. This was a young man about 23. He's still living, he recovered. And over there are his family, his wife, a very courageous woman and three of his children. I think he had five altogether. The two boys in the street were done in 55. I wanted to show the environment plus the people that were living there. The two little girls at the top, that's 1959. Uh, when I painted James Farmer, he loved this painting. I painted his two daughters. He owns that now. You know. Oh. I love that. All right, so just one last gem from the Copenhagen archive. This is a party flyer that is inviting festival and conference attendees to a house party. And I love that people are being encouraged to bring their musical instruments and poems to celebrate the festival. So after Copenhagen, women from 17 participating countries came together and founded the International Organization of Women in the Arts. So we can really see that as a beginning of the culmination of all of this work. Let's go to the next slide. Beautiful. All right, so now it's five years later and we are in Nairobi, Kenya. The festival this time around is sponsored by Mid-March Associates the National Women's Conference Committee and the American Cultural Center. And the center of this festival was the American Album Project, which was created by Eloise Schleuder and described as a grassroots art project that would quote, 
function as a tangible outreach from the women in the United States to women at the Nairobi conference. And the way that this worked was that questionnaires were sent to women's art organizations with distribution for distribution to their membership or their network, asking for statements about their lives as women and their lives as artists. And then all of these entries were brought together, compiled into nine albums that had custom made um, fiber covers. And then they were shown as a group in Nairobi. And then in addition to that, blank albums were placed in situ at the festival so that attending women could make their mark. There's been a little bit of a shift of funding in Nairobi, uh, significantly less money is coming from the government at this point. Let's go to the next one. Great. So here we have a list of some of the planned programs for the festival. Again, something else has changed here and we can see that the program has matured and expanded a bit. There has been a transition in leadership. Nancy Cusick is now the project director. And then, as I mentioned, Ellery Schleuder is the one who thought of and coordinated the American Album Project, which was an expansion of her 1978 Friendship Quilt. And in discussing the festival, Schleuder noted that, quote, it has connected me with a large community of women artists and has taught me that without question, there is no one way to make art. One must do it her way, and in doing so, it becomes valid and speaks for you to others, end quote. Um, we have some returning participants, including Faith Ringgold and Rosalind Mesquita. And now we're going to take a look at some of the artists who were included in the American Album Project. Next one. Great. So here we get a sense of how the albums actually looked. There's a piece of art on one side and then a brief bio or statement facing it. This is the entry of a local DC artist who was involved with the Washington Women's Art Center, which we also have the archive here at NIMWA. And I love this piece for its gesture and clarity. Um, and her resume notes that in her work, Stein is, quote, permitted to express strong feelings and shape and color, which is not possible in an ordinary level of communication. Let's go to the next one. All right, so apologies for the image being a little bit crooked. Despite my best effort scanning, some of them still came out a little bit cocky wobble, but in my defense, this one was actually mounted cocky wobble. So it's not actually on me. Um, and there's just such a huge variety of work in these collections that I think clearly stems from the diverse participants and their varied practices. I love this one in particular for a few reasons. I love the use of the graph paper. And I think that with the suggestion of scale and sculpture, it really brings to mind the Russian constructivists to me. And then I also love this picture of the artist Brody. She looks like a woman that I would like to have a cup of tea or whiskey with. Let's go to the next one. Great. And Anastasia Sarah Metis is a really interesting artist who made her way to DC via Greece and Paris. And according to her fact sheet, she is known for introducing handmade paper assemblages as a painterly medium for Greek artists. So again, here we have the use of graph paper again, but then also thread and fiber. And there's so much texture in this piece, and I wish you could just reach through your screens to touch it. And the collection is just filled with items like this of women using all different types of materials and mediums within the context of a small postcard or poster. Okay, so now we're going to switch gears, decades, and continents, and head to Beijing for the last stop of our festival tour. Next slide. Great. So now we're in Beijing. It's late summer of 1995, and at the UN conference, they have just adopted the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, which is now considered a key policy document for gender equality. And this is also where Hillary Rodham Clinton made her famous women's rights or human rights speech. The festival this time around was co-sponsored by NIMWA and then financially supported by the National Women's Conference Committee. An interesting thing about the Beijing festival is that the site for the art piece of it wasn't actually assigned until the day before the organizers left for China. So when they arrived, they ended up hanging the um, show at the Beijing headquarters of an American law firm. Shortly after the install, however, individuals from the Chinese government arrived and demanded that the show be taken down because they didn't have permission. But after some significant back and forth between the organizers and the Ministry of Culture, the show was able to stay up. Let's go to the next one. A notable who saw the show is Buddy for Dan. And upon seeing it, she said, quote, women must be free to express their feelings, desires, and hopes in a creative way. No woman must be forced to remain silent in the verbal or artistic expression of her views. Next one, please. 
great. So much like the two preceding festivals, women from around the world were invited to participate. And similar to the way they did it in Nairobi, the festival organizers made use of existing women's arts organizations to get the word out. So here we have the application of a woman named Linda Erico Musso, who was coming from Peru. And in addition to her fun use of color and her hearts instead of check marks, check out the bottom of this piece. In the bottom of the form, it mentions Nimwa. And as we will see, this final festival was shown beyond Beijing, including at our own museum. Let's go to the next one, please. So in Beijing, over 880 works of arts were shown that represented 27 countries. Um, here on the left, we have a photograph by a woman named Barbara Cofino, and then on the right, one by Ellen Kaplowitz. And so in addition to being shown in Beijing, a smaller group of uh, pieces was exhibited in Hairu, China. 53 of the American paintings were shown at Elite Gallery in Moscow. 200 works were shown at the United States Department of Health and Human Services Gallery. 300 works were shown at the Peace Museum in Detroit. And then in the spring of 1996, we had a show here at NIMWA called Look at the World Through Women's Eyes. So we can really start to see the network coalesce and to present these works beyond the, um, the context of the UN festivals. Let's go to the next one. So who were the artists this time? This is a letter from a woman named Odana Alsop, who is from Guyana. And first we'll note that she heard about the festival through a newsletter coming out of England, which is demonstrating both the reach of this project, as well as some of the networks that had already existed and were being utilized and built upon. As in Copenhagen and Nairobi, all participants were asked to send either art or slides, and then this time also an entrance fee. And we can see in this letter the way in which women artists were supporting each other, both locally and globally, with Alsop paying the entrance fees for four of her colleagues. Let's go to the next one. And here we actually get to see one of the two pieces that Alsop sent to the festival. This is a photograph of one of her paintings titled Bad Woman Falls. And on the back, Alsop writes that, quote, folklore tells us that this is a meeting place for women of questionable repute. After months of rough life, oh, excuse me, prospectors go into the interior of Guyana to seek for gold and diamonds. After months of rough life, they return homeward on foot and by rivercraft, and the route goes past this waterfall. Here they are often met by women who relieve them of some of their hard-earned treasure, hence the name Bad Woman Falls. Let's go to the next one. So here we have another slightly crooked image. Um, this piece was made by Catherine Allen from British Columbia, Canada, and is another assemblage piece. This is a print that's overlaid with paint and lace depicting the torso of a pregnant woman. And the title behind the veil to me suggests the dual realities of being pregnant. You know, on one hand, her body is asserting itself in this really public way. And on the other, she's experiencing something really private or intimate behind the veil. So we have this textured play of those two states. Let's go to the next one. And then finally, we have this really beautiful ink piece by a woman from Malaysia named Sharifa Zurara Al Jeffrey. And the beautiful and striking simplicity of this piece represents ideas that are both complex and universal. It means Rahim, which is translated as compassionate or, more, or most merciful. And Al Jeffrey writes that, quote, it also means the womb, which is a precious gift from God. We must respect the womb and through this extend our respect to all humankind. Yet women and young girls are continually being raped, killed, and maimed. When will human beings realize that when women are raped and killed, it is not just the female population of a certain community or country that is being erased, but the whole of mankind. Let's go to the next one. So just looking at the legacy of these shows, here on the left, you see the cover for the brochure that was made for the Nimwa exhibition of the Beijing Festival. And I think these collections really demonstrate the diverse array of art that visually documents the universality of issues that confront women. And as they rest now in our archives, the collections have become an important historical record of the artistic contributions that women continue to give to the world. So in addition to the Beijing show traveling, the American album project from Nairobi traveled to Oakland, Silver Spring, Charlotte, 
Dallas, Black Mountain College, and the Women's Registry of Minnesota Conference. And as I mentioned, we had some exhibitions at NIMWA. In addition to Look at the World's Women's Eyes, which happened in 1996, we also had a show in 1991 called A Salute to Women, which was a postcard exhibition showing images and um, pieces from Copenhagen and Nairobi. We, like I said, have um, artists that participated in our collection at NIMWA, including Faith Ringgold and Betty Saar. And then also in our collection at the Library and Research Center, many of the artists that showed that were local to DC can be found in other archival collections that we have, including Gallery 10 and the Washington Women's Art Center. And then also in our um, vertical files and our artist files, we have tons of ephemeral material and we have a lot of files for women that participate in these festivals. So please keep in mind that these collections and the art that was shown are open by appointment to the public uh, for viewing and research. So just reach out to me or any of my colleagues at the LRC to make an appointment if you're interested. And thank you so much for spending part of your day with me and for celebrating uh, International Women's Day with the Library and Research Center. Thank you so much, Emily. That was so wonderful. I learned so much I did not know. So thank you. And seeing all, I think you mentioned it multiple times, seeing the women helping women helping women is just so, it's, you know, what we at NIMWA want to celebrate every day, but especially today for everyone. So thank you so much for that and for all those images. I know we have some questions in the chat, so I will make sure to share those with Emily um, for some follow-up on some links and the, the list of artists that you mentioned as you're working on. Yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so we will definitely uh, follow back up with you as Emily said, thank you and um, happy International Women's Day and go high five some women. <laughs> And create some art. All right. Thank you so much, Emily. And you, you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.